Hello, Las Vegas, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Golf at the Park, Angel Park Golf Club's weekly interview show. This week, we've got Andrew Frazier on the show. Andrew, thanks for coming in. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me, Jay. Really appreciate it. Um, Andrew actually is our first guest that has never played Angel Park. Um, uh, quick background, Andrew works a similar position to mine at Dobson Ranch Golf Club in uh, technically Mesa, Arizona, right outside of Phoenix. And so we're going to talk a lot about our similarities in how we go after social media. We're very similar. We have a connection through Random Golf Club and Brett Bruniel. We're going to talk a little bit about. But since it's your show, we're going to start at the beginning. Why don't you yeah. tell me where you're from and when you got introduced to golf? For sure. So grew up in Northern California, um, about 45 minutes to an hour outside of San Francisco. Um, at the time, my dad was a huge golfer. Um, funny enough, my first word as a baby was golf, um, which was, was made for a good story when it was one of the first sports that I quit. <laughs> um, but, you know, and it's funny, I've noticed a trend on your guys' show, and, and we, we see it all the time, I'm sure, with all these people getting into golf, is there's a huge conversion from baseball players to golf, and that was the sport as a kid as I quit football and soccer and golf and all the other ones. Baseball was the one I kind of doubled down on. I noticed one of yeah. the comments on one of the episodes that you watched, you said, I can relate to the baseball baseball to golf swing. Oh yeah, dude. It's uh and it's funny because we talked about it I think in that exact episode it was uh the the golf fathers when you had their second member on. Yep. He was talking about how much the swings in both sports change over the years. Um and he was saying how he grew up just throwing his hands at the ball on baseball, and so he couldn't clear his hips in golf. And I don't even know. I quit probably when I was like 11, so I never even got that into the mechanics of the swing. But what I do remember is coaches saying, baseball coaches telling me my golf swing was going to ruin my uh, baseball swing and vice versa. So I knew at the time there was a lot of this. And um, it was interesting because now you have a lot more instructors and people, and not to go on too much of a tangent about the swing, but there's a lot of people who claim, like, if you're an athlete, like, you'll have a good swing. You There is no one right way anymore that's becoming a lot more common. And, uh, you know, looking back, I notice even today when I go play softball and try to relive my glory days, uh, my shoulder will hurt super bad, and I'm a lefty, so when uh, my back shoulder hurts, my swing's atrocious. I can't do all the normal things, and so I'm wondering how many people out there had a bad golf swing because of those baseball injuries or vice versa. That's interesting. You know? So you kind of quit golf at 11. Yep. When do you start playing again? Uh, started playing again right around 2014-15 uh, when I was kind of coming to a close uh, with college, getting close to graduating. Uh, I went to San Diego State, so moved from the campus area out to Pacific Beach. Uh, Tough finally, place to go to school. It was really hard. You know, <laughs> I Please cry for me out there. Um, but no, it was cool, and I finally had enough space to bring my golf clubs down. So when I did, um, I had a roommate that was just getting into golf too. We were both lefties. He was a hockey player and I was a baseball player. So we were just two goons that would go. We would walk Mission Bay Golf Course once a week when we could. Um, and it was just a blast. It was fun to get out there. Um, it's a shorter golf course there too. It's probably like your guys' cloud nine. Um, so there were never really opportunities to hit driver, um, which I think was probably best for me to get reintroduced to the game because it kept uh, the frustration a lot more in check. Yeah. You know, so uh, learned, relearned how to play and uh, just really kind of found an appreciation for it as I finished formal sports and I graduated from school. I was like, well, I'm getting into that adult world, I need something else to uh, to hang on to. But still recreationally, just with yep. pals going <clears throat> totally. out occasionally and playing. Yep, yep. And we were we were so broke, so we weren't even betting money. Our bets were whoever loses the hole had to carry. They didn't have ice chests at that course, so we would walk with a plastic bag. They would fill with ice and give us the beer. So the loser had to carry that. Oh, that's <laughs> great. The hole. Um, what kind of clubs did you start playing with? Um, I had always had hand-me-downs, and so right before I made the move um, to Arizona, which is where I currently live, I went and uh, got fitted at the Carlsbad Golf Center, um, picked up a set of M6s. Um, they did an awesome job, too, and that it was super simple as a recreational golfer to get fitted. She just kept handing me clubs. I put ones that I liked in one pile, ones that didn't feel good in another, and she helped me whittle it down. It was really simple. I don't know what was going on behind the scenes. Um, and then very quickly, as my swing improved, I kind of grew out of those. The swing weight was way off. 
And so I now have a set of the Callaway Apex Pros. So I don't deserve them, right. but I got them. Yeah, they look that's, cool. that's great. Um, well, we're going to get into the fact that you're not only not a purist, but um, yeah. interestingly, you've never been bit by the bug. Yeah. Um, you just uh, have had an opportunity to work in golf. So for why don't sure. we start with how you ended up at Dobson and tell us that story. Yeah, for sure. And one of the one of the first things you and I realized we had in common is there's an element of nepotism in our stories, right? So I, uh, I had sort of what I call a quarter life crisis. I was 22, 23, graduated, thought I was going to go down this set path I had planned on all my life, got into it, was even pretty good at it, and just was absolutely miserable. And uh, so I ended up deciding to go a different route. Uh, didn't really have much direction. I just knew I needed to get away from what I was doing. And I went back to an old college job until an opportunity came up to move to Arizona. My girlfriend at the time and now wife, um, her family lived there. So it was a, a chance to get closer to them. Um, it was with the business that her stepdad uh, had been running for 20 years. So I moved out there. She was able to go back to school. We got close to family. And uh, I just fell in love with the golf culture. I fell in love with the people who had been bit by the bug and just seeing their passion for it and golf as an escape and golf as like a rec activity. Um, I really just appreciated how much it means to golfers, honestly. And so um, just being able to sink my teeth in and learn everything about the business that I could, see the things that the business did great, see the shortcomings. And then my own personal drive was just being able to breathe life into, um, you know, teams that golf courses don't typically um, pay very great. They don't really have engaged employees. Um, so to be able to create a different culture and atmosphere um, was kind of a cool project for me to have. And I was really blessed to just get that much responsibility out of the gate. So, so start with right as you start at Dobson, um, what your job is and, and how you start to go about um, formatting it and, and, yeah. and growing Dobson. <clears throat> because Dobson Ranch, one of the reasons that we're having him on is there's so many similarities between Angel Park and Dobson. Um, and especially in the way that their social marketing is being run. So yeah. I was really interested to just get your take on, on the similarities between the courses. So tell us all about Dobson and, and, and how your job's been for, what, four years now? Yeah, we're coming up on four years and two days from when we're filming it. So it's, oh man, time's really fly, uh, flying by. But there's pretty much two parts to it, right? So there was the goals and what we kind of call pillars for Dobson and us getting that deal and what we knew first year or two, these were the things we had to do. And it was create a relationship with the existing customers, go back to reacquiring old customers who had sworn the place off and acquire new customers who may not know it existed. Um, and all at the same time, one of our, our mottos as a, a management group is, you know, happy customers, motivated team is profitable growth. And the joke is not that profitable growth is just on the financial side. While that's great, um, it's actually seeing the growth in the property, seeing the atmosphere grow and seeing the employees sort of find their rhythm and what they like. Um, and so to answer it more personally, my first job was learn it all. It was learn how to scrub clubs, learn how to clean carts, learn how to answer the phones, book tea time, sell it. Just I was asked to get in there, learn as much as I could, find out how everything ticks. And then from there, I was fortunate enough to just have mentors and people helping me along the way that uh, they knew enough about the golf industry that when I came to them with something I was noticing, they could explain it. We could uh, form a plan and, and address it and improve on it or whatever we needed to do. So, and that's where our golf courses are very, very much aligned in all of those same goals. Mm -hmm. And and that's what we've been working on. COVID, um, the pandemic, definitely helped golf become um, more attractive to people for all the reasons about getting outside and all of those things. Um, and one of the things that right at the same time that happened with us is we started to notice. Uh, local influencers and and um, just golfers who love to create content at all the different courses. Yeah. And, and we've embraced that. And I know you're doing that, too. So let's talk a little bit about the similarities there. Yeah, for sure. So um, Paradigm Golf Group and, and now our secondary company, and we'll talk about it more later, I'm sure. But Smashers On Solutions is kind of the name we're going with for now. Um, they've all we've always had this idea and, and where marketing is something that golf as an industry doesn't do a great job of. 
So we've always picked at all the locations where we either own or operate or manage to have like a operational influencer. So somebody who actually worked in the day to day, somebody who was actually a part of it and knew what was going on. And as long as you could speak clearly on camera and get it in, you know, 10, 15 takes, whatever you needed, they would just go on and we'd use those mediums to talk about specials as simple as like a back nine and breakfast, or it's a summer special because it's 110 and so it's half off range balls, whatever it was. And we would focus on just the local markets and we were happy if it was 500 followers and all 500 were in a 20 mile span. That's a lot of potential to actually breathe life into a facility. And um, it was super funny. So our actual, we'd always been interested and obviously like, you know, media consumers ourselves, we knew about influencers, we have our own favorites. Um, But one of the biggest turning points I think for us was a big shout out to Sam Jagoda on this one. We had people coming in. It started with our staff that was sending me uh, when TikTok was still pretty early on. It had just switched, uh, probably not just switched, but um, it wasn't musically anymore. And probably about two years ago, I kept getting these videos, this video sent, and it was um, Sam Jagoda, who now has done an awesome job and found his own niche in social media. But he had just done a little review of our range, how you know he had moved away, he came back, and whenever he comes back home to visit, Dobson was his favorite range. At that time, we had some shade installed, we had top tracer, we had all these things, and everyone was asking, like, dude, where'd you find this guy? Did you guys pay him? And I was like, that's the coolest part. Like, he did this on his own. They so, enjoy doing it. Exactly. And, and, and we're helping them grow by... For sure. Yeah. So and, the courses, we have a product, and their product, um, I would say our our Sam would be Mike the Video Wizard, yeah. who... who would just wanted to come out and shoot content because he's a filmmaker and he wanted to totally anything that he could shoot. And, um, and he helped us uh, way more than we helped him in, in, in my opinion. For sure. Um, but it, and now he's been able to grow and learn how to monetize it and, and become his own company. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's, that's been awesome. fun. And, and you guys have worked with babes golf yep. and I know we've had babes golf out here who are Southern Cal influencers. Um, and, us especially uh, being a destination um, property, we're interested in out of market as much as local because totally. we want to be the place that people say, well, when we go to Vegas, we want to play under the lights at Angel Park type thing. Yeah. Um, and you guys are doing that, but you're you're really good at doing it locally too. So tell us a little bit about how, how Babes got involved with you and, and Coach Natalie because I know she's been great too. Oh, yeah. Talk about one of the most important t- pieces of the puzzle. And it was funny because – we, we with Sam, we actually DM'd him too, and he ended up working for us for a little while. Um, we hired him as like a freelancer to edit videos and stuff. And then as his stuff kind of popped off, we said, dude, go do your thing. And now he's doing it. And so very similar thing, um, story with golf coach Natalie and uh, Babes Golf and talk about two things moving independently and how they kind of come to a head. And we just happen to be the place they collided. Um, you know, Natalie found us. She lived up in Scottsdale and worked at a Top Golf up there at the time. She was moving closer to us. She had seen our content. She reached out asking if we were hiring. So something we never would have expected, right? People find you and, and apply for jobs, even through your marketing. It's not just to acquire customers. Um, and she ended up being an awesome part of the team in the operation, working in the golf shop, helping with our junior clinics that we run. Um, and we knew from day one she had shared that you know youth and women's golf was not only her background but her passion. And um, Babes had sort of reached out very closely to when she got on board. And so she was um, – Natalie was connected with them super quick. And so it was just kind of the perfect storm that, like you said, we had the facility – we, you know, we were totally bought into what their vision was, and I'm sure you guys have experienced it, but something that baffled us in, in the very early days of the influencers kind of emerging was, like, golf courses all just slammed doors on them. Nobody was – nobody even – not that they needed open arms, but, like, nobody even took their call. Right. Which, uh, for us, we were like, hey, man – we're entrepreneurs. You're a salesperson too. You're chasing a dream. If there's a way we can help, go for it. If it was give them a sunset time, let them film three, four holes when no one else is going out. If it was let them go out early in the morning and play in the middle of the course, however we could help, um, we we committed to and we held up on on that end. And it's just been a super cool thing. And Babes started their chapter in Arizona. Um, Alex is super funny story. We have loose relations. It turned out that she worked uh, at a golf course we managed in Hollister, California years ago. 
years ago, but it was a happenstance thing. Um, it's not why she sought us out, but she was starting her chapter in Arizona and with Natalie's help and Alex actually moved to Arizona for part of the year. And, uh, they've just ex- absolutely exploded out there too. And I know they have, that's their third chapter. Shout out to Alex. Yeah, we need yeah. a Vegas chapter. I know. I, and she's <laughs> talk about someone who's hungry, man. She does an amazing job with, with getting those things up and running and, uh, her ability to just talk about her vision and the dream and, um, you know, the authenticity behind it all has been super cool. Just seeing the, the variability in the events that they do. Um, and speaking of man, Brett, you mentioned him in the very beginning. I was, well, one I was going to say the Brett, best people Brett, I've ever met. So Brett Bruniel is the one who ties us together, actually, totally. because I didn't know of Drew. I knew of Dobson Ranch um, very well, actually, just because of my youth in Arizona. Mm-hmm. But um, Brett Bruniel comes up a lot on the show. We still haven't been able to get him because he lives in Phoenix now. But um, he started the Las Ve- Las Vegas Random Golf Club yeah. chapter. He came to us and. Um, and we were we were the same way. We were like, hey, we'll figure out a way to get you guys a meetup where you all walk at the same time on a golf mm-hmm. course, which isn't easy for a golf course to for do. Sure. Um, and uh, it was it was obviously our range was set up good for them. Cloud Nine sets up really well for yeah. them. So um, Brett was um, one of the key first influencers that we worked with here. And then he moved to Phoenix and started his chapter of Random Golf Club Phoenix. So tell me how he reached out to you. Did he just hit you up and say, I'm looking for a golf course? Yeah, as far as I know, so the the Random Golf Club connection, full transparently uh, transparency, the credit to that goes to another one of our team members, Matt Stark. He's, he's an awesome guy. He has a super cool story. He's been with us for probably about two years now, but from day one when he came on, he's someone who's been much more in tune with kind of the outside golf influencer world. Um, than I was. And and part of that's because I'm not a huge golfer myself. Right. Um, But he had always said how his dream was to have a Phoenix chapter of Random Golf Club. And just the way he talked about it, like he had wanted to get us connected somehow. He's like, you guys are exactly what they're about, uh, much like Angel Park. And so however we can do it, and and he's a dog on a bone. He's a true salesperson too. So when he caught wind that there was a Phoenix chapter coming, uh, he instantly connected with Brett and we were fortunate enough to do their first meetup. And I think we had like 80 or 90 people show up for the first ever Phoenix chapter. So awesome. Nine hole walking. We had done a, a range meetup just before just to meet them and, and expose Phoenix to random golf club. And even that had like 40 or 50 people come to the range. Um, and it's just been super cool ever since. And it's been nice because we've been able to help open some of those doors for Brett. Um, you know, he's had ton of suggestions of where to do them and stuff like that. And so we've been able to be a second front for him where we can go advocate like, Hey, I know what you guys are thinking. We're operators too. 70 people playing a hole together. Sounds like a nightmare. It's not Brett and the crew are awesome. I promise you guys will love it. And so we've just been super happy, not only to host events, but any way we can help and give back, um, has been a really cool and fulfilling thing for us too. Yeah. Another one of the things that we lock up on property wise is the idea of, of embracing all different forms of golfers, right? Um, you don't just have to be someone who goes out and plays 18 holes of golf and spends four and a half hours on a golf course. Mm-hmm. Um, Angel Park has the putting course and the, and the cloud nine. You guys focus on golfers that might only want to come out for short amounts of time. Tell us about how you've, you've tried to open up accessibility to, to new golf, new golfers. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, there's, there's so many avenues and a lot of those avenues are kind of obvious ones, right? We have, um, an awesome foundation we started for junior golf and, you know, we've been able to do everything from partnering with group homes and foster programs and stuff, especially during the pandemic, just to give, um, these groups of kids who really just needed somebody to give them some attention and give them some appreciation and be kind of a safe spot for them to come hang out all the way to the things like babes golf, um, and everything in between, but to kind of the point I think you're getting at is that 18 holes of golf takes a long time. Even when you're a fast player, it takes, you know, with no one on a course, you could probably play in two and a half, three hours. When you're as busy as both of our facilities are, you're looking at four hours is pretty standard, four and a half's not outside the norm either. For people, when you start to factor in a 20-minute drive each direction, four or five hours doing that, getting ready, playing, you're talking about like an entire day. 
And that, um, you know, I look at these things more from just like a what they are type deal. And to me, all of those are layers of resistance that keep people away. It makes it easier for people to say no to the sport. Um, so driving ranges are obviously something that have always been with golf courses traditionally looked at as like, I'm going to get better. I'm going to practice here so I can be great over there. Um, and then with the emergence of Top Golf and some of the gamification that goes on, um, it's done an amazing job. It's why Callaway bought them and everything. You know, there's so many people that have now been exposed to golf because of it. And Top Tracer has now started a new push to put Top Tracer on driving ranges. And I think TrackMan's doing it too. And so we've really seen the upside and the opportunity to take what was a practice facility, like a pitcher throwing a bullpen. Now you can just go play catch with your dad. You can go hit the range, take your family. Um, it's a fraction of the price of Top Golf. It is more of an entertainment thing, but you don't have to sacrifice the high quality practice side of it, which is the ultimate like duo because you don't have to alienate anybody. Right. And you like know? ours, you have a lit driving range. Yep. We've and got you've made lights. some improvements. So why don't you talk about your driving range? Yeah. So we've had lights. We were fortunate enough. Those were already in place. The standards for timing were kind of already set because um, Dobson is a city facility. Same as Angel so, Park. Um, so it's a city facility. We have a great partnership with the city of Mesa and um, all the lights were already there. There are some apartments, and you might know this from back in the day, there's some apartments that are out a little ways, but not close enough that there's really too much light pollution. So we're good. We stay open till about 10 p.m. is when we do lights out, stop selling balls about an hour before. Um, so we just do everything, especially when it's as hot in the desert. You know, you're looking for all the times you can to get people out there. And I'm a firm believer that when you have our product is that facility and that space and the experience, and it's up to the, the guests how they want to use it. If they want to practice, they can practice. If they want to bring their friends and family and pregame before they go out in Scottsdale, they can do that too. If they want to compete and do contests and stuff, we host those nights. You know, just giving people the options has really been kind of the key to seeing that boom happen at our facility outside of just all of golf, right? That's cool. Um, tell me a little bit about more about the smash on your hat. Yeah, yeah. So the smash on my hat, um, and I talked about it a second earlier, um, Smashers On and Smashers On Solutions um, is a new company that we've kind of started because we see this opportunity with the driving ranges and sort of um, – it's one of those things where a lot of golf courses right now are kind of riding that high and um, not to be doom and gloom, but at any point, who knows how these things could turn. Sure. Golf, like a lot of hobbies, is one of the first things that you go ahead and you shelf. Um, but when the time commitment and the cost associated is much lower, you don't have to, you don't look to trim the fat that way, right? So doubling down on these ranges and just understanding how much a little bit of an investment and attention to detail can go into those for such a big return and so much reach to a community. Um, it's something that we're extremely passionate about now, and it's kind of the next project we have that's going on. And we've since installed Top Tracer at our other three courses um, total. So two other ones besides Dobson, one's in Palm Beach, Florida, um, PBN, shout out to Mikey D and his crew. And then on the island of Maui, we have one, and they're the first. They don't have a Top Golf out there, so they're the first ones to have Top Tracer. They have a massive, great shade structure that's all solar panels, so it's cool. It runs everything too, um, and it's just both of those locations have really popped off, like very, very low turnaround, and a lot of that's because. Dobson was like the firstborn. We made all the mistakes with it. Now you have the second and third kid and you kind of know what you're doing. Um, so it's been a super fun trip. And then um, there's a lot of cool projects that are going on too. And I'll just tease it some, but we have an app that's coming. Um, and we've talked with Top Tracer even about it. And they have such focus on other directions that they're kind of fine with us going ahead and trying to develop an app and it's already up and running to a degree that lets people compete from any of the top tracer ranges against friends or in tournaments or, on their own or time. In leagues exactly on their own time and i forgot his name again but you told me earlier he was so, here yeah when we yeah, were yeah. talking about this earlier he 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 watched the episode a couple of weeks ago with robbie knickerbocker yeah who, yeah his, his group of friends some who live across the country every other year they get together and they go on golf trips and you were explaining that Totally. This app will will be something um, in theory that they'll be able to compete 
without all having to get together. Exactly. And and that was where my inspiration came from it. Like living in San Diego, we had Del Mar right next to it. I know Babes Golf uses that as well. They have Top Tracer, the exact same stuff that Dobson has. So to me, I was like, man, I wish I could, you know, they do those cool every other year golf trips, but they have to get together. It's a big thing. And, and so what if in between they could stay connected? All they need is a top tracer range and driving distance from them. All of the games are standardized across locations. Even Top Golf has most of the same stuff, and Top Golf's retrofitting older facilities with the newer technology, like what we have. Um, and then you can, we can do head-to-head play. So I talked about words with friends. You could, I could make a match on my phone, send you a text with a link, and you and I'll play head-to-head and see who wins. And then we could do it again and again. Um, that's the coolest without part. even having to play it with each other. Exactly. I could do it while I'm at work or I could do it right now and send it to one of our teammates back in Arizona. He could do it when he gets off today. And then there's kind of the league or the fantasy side of it where, you know, it's great for locations. Think like a golf genius type deal, like a location. So Dobson could run a Dobson league. We're running one right now. And PBN in Florida has been doing a great job. They're on their fourth and final week for this season. They've had 80 plus people playing every, every week, um, all through Monday to Sunday. Um, and they're competing for prizes, free rounds of golf. So as a marketing tool, it's great for a facility. And then you've got groups of friends who they can connect with us. We'll set up the league to the parameters they want as best as we can. And then they can play for bragging rights throughout. They can, in all their group chats, everybody's got going on nowadays. They can, you know, talk smack about who won last week. Uh, groups that got birdie chains, you can get top tracer chains, whatever they want to do, right. you know? <clears throat> cool stuff. All right, let's go back to your, your golf yeah. story. So four years ago, you're working in golf. And the cliche is um, often when you're working in golf, you play less golf. Yeah. So have you started playing more? Um, I didn't. Uh, I haven't played much. I definitely, I was kind of like gunpowder. I flashed when I started working. I played a ton. And then I think after that first summer, we got so busy. The days get really short, you know, in Arizona with the winter time. Um, and truth be told, I have other hobbies that I enjoyed. Um, and so for me, a lot of people that get bit by the bug, it's replacing something, right? It's a, it's their new hobby and their new escape. And I was just at a point, ironically, where I still had one or two things that I already did with my leisure time. Um, and I think admittedly, part of that is why I had kind of accelerated the way I did at Dobson was because instead of going and playing every day when I got off work, I would just kind of like lerp around the golf shop and talk to customers. And while I wasn't working anymore, I was still observing. I was hearing stories. I was getting feedback and I was spending time with the team, seeing how we could all do better. Um, and so I found my enjoyment at Dobson in that facet. Um, but I'll definitely go through stints. I'll play. Well, it makes you such an interesting ambassador for the game, I think, because, um, you, you are coming at it from a love of the game, um, just from a completely different angle, which mm-hmm. I've always kind of felt I, I did because I came up uh, through a family of purists and right. started that way and then, and then totally turned it around. I always felt like I was trying to, to grow the game from a different angle than, than what was normally being done. And we, we had the totally. conversation about how golf is changing and, For sure. and there's ways to adapt to it while still maintaining all of the tradition and, and the important parts of it while also making it more accessible, which I think is great. So yeah. I guess that leads me to um, what are some things that you would still like to work on changing about golf that, that, you, that you think could be better? Yeah, I think, you know, Number one, it's something that I kind of alluded to earlier, and this isn't even necessarily a dig at any one group or entity that's in golf, but really looking at what those barriers to entry really are. I mean, people talk about time and money, and of course, those are really big apparent ones. Um, You know, and even though it's been a short time actually working in it, I'm a part of a group now that's been doing this for 20 years. And, you know, even our owners, neither of them are for none of them went to the PGM program. Not even all of our facilities have a PGA professional necessarily associated with it. And so what we've been able to see from the outside in, and I'm sure there's some biases baked into this, but, you know, when you look at what golf was when it started, it was a high end, a pretty exclusive thing. And over the years, as that transitioned to be a public, you know, recreational activity, 
there was the want to use it as a tool, but there was really no change in like the mindset or kind of the business strategy. So you have systems and facilities that were designed for really high dollar memberships and the cost to keep them up is huge and all these things. Um, and then you just dump it on a city and you're like, cool, now it's going to be the equivalent of a park. Um, and we want people to do it. Well, that's why a lot of municipal courses don't make it is because they're supposed to be accessible and cheap, but then they don't have enough money or people that understand what's going on to keep it up. And then it's the conditions go bad and no one wants to golf there. And then you don't have money and it's this vicious cycle. Um, so to me, it's a little bit more abstract, but I just want people to be more open to what they consider golf. It's kind of what you talked about before. And, you know, I get this question and I know that I get looked at as like, oh, do you really mean it? But seriously, for us, like we have two practice greens at Dobson and we have people that come out four days a week probably on their lunch break or before they go to work, all they do is chip and putt. They've come and I've seen their face five times a week for the four years I've been there. And I can confidently say they've never spent a dollar there. And that's fine. Like you need that stuff because you know what, if that guy or gal has a kid or a friend with a kid or somebody and they introduce a golfer to the game, if that person gets bit, so what? Sure. Right. And so you look at like the tennis pickleball dynamic I think both sports are probably booming now because they're they're working in conjunction. And you had a great way you talked about it too. Tell everyone about like the what happened with skiing and snowboarding, right? Right. Yeah. So my dad's um, phrase all through the '80s, when skiing was dying, or, or or not dying, but struggling, and and trying to figure out a way to make skiing more popular and more accessible the snowboard came along and revolutionized the industry. And so my father would always say, golf needs to find its snowboard. And I've been telling him over the last two years, especially is I think social media totally. um, is that snowboard. And, and by proxy, the pandemic too, because it, it just made more people want to gravitate towards the game. And then more people get bit. And again, it's not, it's for different reasons. They all love the game for very similar reasons, but um, they, they get, they love it for different reasons. They weren't necessarily brought up in it or trying to, to be good at it at a young age, which is how it used to be totally. mostly. Yeah. I mean, and, and that was evident to me, you know, a, I kind of lived it, right. I played as a kid and then, so I got my taste of that. But beyond that, like I, even the instructors now, it's always funny, you know, as an operator, you get slow groups, you just do. And there's something you have to address and you go and we have a super proactive approach and we try to be as friendly as you can be. But you know, something else that's been talked about on episodes in the past is just Golf is one of those weird leisure things that what you do affects literally everybody else that day. Right. Um, and so it's funny because you have some of like the old heads and the old instructors that are like, I wouldn't let people go tee off if they were my student until I knew X, Y, Z was checked off the list. And there's, it's such a funny p game of tug of war because I appreciate the heck out of that. And it's kind of true, but it's just as easy to address by saying, Hey Jed, like you've never hit a golf ball before and you booked a tee time today. Perfect, man. A doesn't matter what tee box you play from, do what you want. Heck, you don't even have to play from a tee box. You could drop at those barber poles that are 150 yards out, play a scramble and actually explain what a scramble is X, Y, Z. And, and it starts with that. It starts with looking at these guests and these people coming to the game who are trying to find out how they like golf and what golf is to them. And instead of just saying, you've never played, you shouldn't play 18, we'll give them an alternative. Help set them up. Let them try. No one likes being told what to do or not to do. Um, so that's one of those things where it's a little uncomfortable to have to deal with. But I think that's how this game is going to keep growing, is if people can embrace that side. Um, I, one of the things that I hear from the older generations, I guess is what I'll call it, of, of golf, um, some of the ways that they look at, at new golf they're worried that if we embrace it too much, we're alienating um, an audience that we already have, um, a customer base that we already have. And my counter argument to that is, is that if we're if we're too concerned with that, we're alienating this new audience that's coming in, that that is just as um, detrimental. So it's got to be accessible to all, and yep. that's what we're we're both trying to to get at the end of the day. I think um, that's really really fun, and I we were talking earlier, I, I have all these brainstorm ideas about yeah. um, an interstate rivalry and, and let's do the ranch versus the park. And yeah. we can start it out as, as maybe foursomes and, and have an event that we, we do content pieces on. And then 
we'll expand it to a writer's cup style yeah. format where the idea behind this episode of the show is to have our base know that when they're in Phoenix, Dobson is a cool place to go that's like us and vice versa. Those of you watching this um, interview because Andrew's on and for you to know about Angel Park and for you to come here and, and check us out um, and and embracing all of the the culture and just trying to combine it um, because it's good for everybody. So I for think sure. that part is awesome. And it just makes me excited that, um, that we have all of these opportunities. Um, and I look forward to the rest of our um, relationship. Yeah, I think yeah. it's going to be great. And I think that probably takes us to the end of the first, yeah. uh, the first part of the show. The yeah. second part is the par five. And Here, I'll say this real quick before yeah, yeah. we hit the par five. But, I mean, to that exact point, I have to give you guys all the credit that, you know, it was funny. When I parked and I, I started walking up, I texted you, yeah, I'll meet you in the bag drop. And, like, this facility is so cool and the views are so sweet when you just walk up that I just kept walking. And, like, I got to the railing and saw the putting area and could see the different first tees. And then I was like, oh, shit, like, where's Jed? And so I turned and I around and you were walking drop. towards me. So, <laughs> But it, it is just a testament that, like, your guys' facility is awesome, um, you know, this place is exactly like you guys are going to do such a great job with Vegas because, you know, this embodies what I think a lot, even new people that are coming to Vegas, like you're not coming here for the same reasons people used to, you know, Vegas is, as a whole has shifted so much. And that's just from an outside in perspective. But I mean, the amount of, you know, walking through, it was a kid's 21st birthday. They all piled out the way your team greeted them. Hey yep. guys, like what, where are you visiting from? You know, what's going to be your first drink as a legal beagle. And just that atmosphere is exactly what uh, golf really needs. Yeah. And uh, it was cool to see that. And that's kind of why I was in a trance. I just kept walking because I felt like I was home. You know, that's that's so neat. And and one of the things that I was so flattered by is that you had already started watching the shows. And mm -hmm. I was like, well, when are you going to come to Vegas? Let's get you on. And it just happened. Boom, boom, boom. And, and yeah. I'm really excited about all that. So that's fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Let's do it. Um, and I know you already know the questions. So this is the par five where we ask the same five questions to every guest each week and come up with different answers. So here we go. Question number one. What's your favorite golf movie? Favorite golf movie is Caddyshack for sure. Uh, I know it's a common one, but that's probably one of the easiest to digest movies uh, that like if you aren't a huge golfer because, you know, you said in another episode, it's because it's a comedy. And transparently, it's the only one I've ever watched all the way through. <laughs> and that's why Happy Gilmore became yeah. as popular as it was, is because it's it's a comedy. It's not really a golf movie. For sure. It's a comedy. Yeah. Um, and Caddyshack is played into all of the golf tropes, but right. it was it was super funny. Totally. It's, it's just genius. I think if you asked me before I worked in golf, it would have been happy. Um, but now, like, just having, you know, we and we have an amazing superintendent, but he totally would be the guy trying to fight the gophers. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> just being in Ingrained, that's where that's where it tipped the scale for me. That one hits a little closer to home now. That's great. Question number two. This is going to be interesting. Uh, what's your favorite golf club in your bag and why? And then I actually kind of want to know for you, since you don't play a lot and you've never been bit by the bug, what's your least favorite club in your bag? Yeah, so favorite club in the bag is going to be the driver still. Um, I think you're going to be hard pressed to find former baseball players that don't like it. Like it's, there's one thing everybody can understand in golf and that's hitting the ball far. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's fun. Um, and you know, even a side story to how green I really was to golf, even after playing again for a couple years, I didn't even realize there was different flexes for shafts. So when I moved to Dobson and, and I admittedly have a pretty quick swing, um, just from all the years. And so when they saw like what my bag was, just a hand-me-down set with a regular shaft, they were like, dude, no wonder you, you can't, can't hit, hit it straight. They're like, this is like swinging with a pool noodle. And the day that somebody plugged in, because I only got fitted for irons back then, so I never got uh, a driver fitted. And so when they, the first time they threw on like an LA golf shaft or something for me, and it actually is like a nice stick of rebar, um, dude, it changed the game. So driver is definitely the most fun um, and I only like to play scrambles a lot of the time. So I'm your scramble partner in that regard. Um, balancing that the putter is the worst because I don't practice putting at all. Um, which we, means you're not going to be a good putter. <laughs> totally. Which, and it's, that's why I joke all the time now that I've really, I, we've doubled down on top tracer cause I don't have to putt anymore. You know, if you've never played their virtual golf is like a chipping mini game. So my short game's actually gotten really good cause you chip at the same targets on our range every time to putt. 
Um, so now I don't have to waste any time putting if all I do is play top tracer. That's great. I love that. Question number three. Um, what's your dream foursome? So you get any three people alive or dead to play golf with. Who would you pick yep. and where would you play? Uh, definitely would have to pick uh, my father. I lost him when I was really young. And I'm like I kind of said, oh, it's all it's all good. I appreciate it. Um, and, you know, he was – all my brothers were super into golf because of it, and that's probably why I started as a kid. Um, number two – I'm going to go with Steph Curry just because huge Warriors fan. They were the only team growing up in the Bay Area that I could put a feather in my cap in. Um, so he would be awesome. And we actually have a few juniors out of Dobson that play on his underrated tour. And everything that they've said about him and his crew and the way that they managed that event last year was amazing. And they're excited to play again this year. Um, and for three, I'm going to have to throw Phil in there just because it's another lefty. Lefty. Um, and I think that... And an Arizona kid. Exactly. Right? And and being able to see the cool things he can do with his short game and just knowing that the, the finesse and the touch you need to be good around greens, um, I've really grown to admire that just in any player. Um, where we would play, I would probably have to go... I mean, dude, after hearing the stories about St. Andrews, I don't know how I can't pick any of those courses, just any one of them in Scotland. Robbie, I told you your episode's going to be one of the favorites. Robbie's changing the game. (laughs) (laughs) I don't envy that he has to plan the next one either. That is, dude, those are are big old shoes to fill. That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, Question number four, what's your aiming fluid? So when you're out on the golf course, what are you drinking? So... uh, One thing we didn't even touch on when I was in San Diego State uh, for college, I was in a fraternity, so I still have that, and then I'm not picky with what I drink. Um, But lately, it's been a big high noon kick. So we got high noons at Dobson, and they've just been absolutely money. It's summertime, so it's refreshing. Um, So that right now is kind of the flavor of the week. Love it. That's a great answer. Question number five, the last question of the show, um, may no longer be PG rated. I don't think we've said any swear words in this episode, which is fun. Um, we may now, uh, we never know. Um, you know, the question when, uh, when you hit a bad shot or when you're really, really frustrated, most golfers have one word or phrase they say, what's yours? For sure. I definitely drop my fair share of fuck shit, damn, but it's always followed by this is why I don't play golf. (laughs) This is why I don't play golf. So it's really, this is why I don't play golf is like, yeah, doesn't matter. It's why I don't play golf. You know, it helps me brush it off. And when it's happened a lot, you start to get the extra words. Now that on, I'm going to so. start playing again, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to yeah. steal that. And this yeah, is why this I is don't why play I quit. golf. You know what I mean? For you, yeah, this is why I quit originally. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew, thank you so much for coming on. This one for was sure, fun. Man. Dude, and this um, was a blast. to Dobson Ranch people, thank you for watching to Angel Park people. Thank you for watching. Um, I think this is going to be an exciting little friendship uh, between yeah. courses going forward. And yeah. uh, thanks again. Yeah. Thank you. All right. And thank you for watching. Um, again and until next time hit them straight from your friends at Angel Park cheers